everyone to the uh, Future Beef webinar on Pestivirus in Queensland Herds. Um, this is presented by Dr Geoffrey Fordyce. Over to you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Geoffrey here. Um, thanks for coming along. Hear about something that uh, everyone seems to be asking questions about, and hopefully we can enlighten you. So um, the way I'm going to attack this session today is to look at a number of uh, the main questions that people seem to be asking about pestivirus. And the first one is, um, what is pestivirus and, and how does it get around? The second one is, how much damage can pestivirus cause? Third one is, have I got a problem? Um, how can I prevent problems? And finally, where can I get good advice? Righto. So, the story with pestivirus is that it's everywhere. It's throughout the world, and I can tell you it's throughout Australia as well. That's contracted by direct contact. So one animal meets another animal, um, one animal's got it, and it gives it to another by direct contact, nose or mouth, from a virus shedder. And the virus is, is actually shed from just about every excretion that the carriers have, like um, skin, um, saliva, hair, um, feces, urine, uh, abortion fluids, semen, you name it. Right? So shedders shed virus big time. The virus itself, you know, most viruses sort of are fairly selective. Um, pestivirus can uh, attack a lot of different cells, but it has, it has a predilection for the immune system and the reproductive tract. And that is, um, underlies what are the main pathologies that that occur with this particular virus. The virus basically in Australia um, is, a, is a low damage virus. In, um, uh, in other countries we, they have different forms of the virus that you, know, you just contract a normal virus that floats around and it can cause a, a, a normal clinical disease. But the virus that we have in Australia, if an animal gets it, doesn't tend to cause much clinical disease, but I'll go into that later. The interesting thing is that and some animals are carriers, and I'll explain that later, and some aren't. But in the carrier animals, they have tons of virus on board, and that virus multiplies in cells. It goes into the cell, takes over the, um, the DNA system, and, and replicates itself and exits the cell, and, as I said before, uh, targets the immune system and the reproductive system. Um, doesn't do a hell of a lot of damage, just does a lot of replication, and uh, you know the carriers keep producing zillions and zillions of amounts of this virus. Now because, the, and, and when this process of multiplication in the cell is called non-cytopathic, non, not cytopathic damage. So it doesn't kill the cell. But there are, because there are so many mutations of this virus, that some, um, sorry, so many replications, somewhere along the line generally there is a mutation to a cell killing type of a virus, which is called a cytopathic virus. So you can have an animal that's a carrier, looks perfectly normal, all of a sudden one day um, you get a mutation to a cytopathic virus and over a period of time because of, you know, one makes two, makes four, makes eight, etc. Next thing you know you've got tons of cytopathic virus on board and a cytopathic virus goes in, multiplies in a cell and then to get out instead of just going out the door and closing it, it actually blows the cell apart. And when that happens you can imagine that the animal doesn't last too long. So you get an animal, and this is where the, the, you would have heard of bovine viral, viral diarrhoea comes from, or mucosal disease. That's what happens when the animal, when the cytopathic virus uh, um, uh, uh, mutation occurs, and these animals then develop this terrible clinical disease. And uh, once they develop that, she's all over. Righto. So normally, with with um, if a if a carrier gives um, pestivirus by direct contact to another animal, they have what's called a transinfection infection, just like any other disease. Um, you'll pick up the virus in the blood about two to three days after infection, and you can find, find it in the blood for about 10 days. Generally, in animals that are transiently infected, say you just get a steer, for instance, or a heifer that's transiently infected, and they've got the disease, um, it's unlike us with the flu, you know, if you've got the flu, you splatter someone else and they get the flu. Well, in this particular situation, 
the virus is, is not readily transmitted and very, very low probability, extremely low probability that one animal will give it to another during transient infection, except by semen. And it's important to know that because if you've got a bull that's transiently infected, it can cause a bit of an, cause a few problems. Um, generally after about two weeks after picking up the um, virus, they'll have antibodies and the only real thing that happens, you get temporary mild suppression of the immune system because remember, remember the virus has a predilection for immune cells in the reproductive system. There's, you know, if the reproductive system is not, not active, it's not an issue. The infection clinically is barely noticeable with a very mild fever and unless you're acutely aware of what's going on and monitoring it, uh, there's no way you're going to pick it up. So bovine respiratory disease is one of the main forms of this um, of the of disease that pestivirus causes in Australia. Fortunately, um, it's not really a feature of North Australian situations. Um, it's what occurs in high performance conditions such as feedlots. And the key thing that happens in there, you've got animals on the edge metabolically, you've got immune suppression by pestivirus and they're exposed to all sorts of pathogens in those situations and it leads to a range of opportunist infections and the most common result is severe pneumonia. So the BRD, as common as it is in, in feedlots in southern Australia, can be reduced by good backgrounding to minimise stress because that further helps the immune system and secondly, vaccination against pestivirus. Two of the big... Um, uh, moves these days is making sure animals that go into feedlots uh, um, have that sort of backgrounding to minimise the incidence of BRD. The other big area that uh, pestivirus can play a, a role is in reproductive wastage. As we said, if the virus targets the reproductive system, it can halve pregnancy rates in some situations, so it can have diabolical effects, but you need a specific situation to set that up. If an animal is um, <clears throat> three to four months pregnant, about half of them will abort up to you know up to, um, you know between about one and four months pregnant. If it's over four months, basically by that stage, the virus attacks the cow. It also attacks the fetus, but the fetus itself has an immune system just like the cow, just like you and I. Uh, it recognises that it's foreign forms an immune response, gets antibodies, bobs your uncle, no problem. So past, you know, mid-pregnancy and beyond, um, there's no particular drama with pestivirus. Um, if, whether, if, it, if you've got the, a calf that develops immunity or you get this abortion situation, in both cases there's a recovery from the inflammation caused by the virus and the animal will return to normal fertility um, fairly readily. Some surviving fetuses, so I said before that if they're, um, if they're up to one month pregnant, so basically all those are aborted, between one and four months, some of, the, some of the fetuses will survive. And they will have, some of them, uh, have mild to severe deformities of birth. The most common deformities, if it has one, is an absence of brain sections, so which is the dummy calf syndrome, or skeletal abnormalities. But quite often these calves are born completely normal. And what they are is what's called a persistently infected animal. And the issue here is that if this fetus, remember I said earlier that if a fetus is in mid-pregnancy or beyond, it actually has an immune system and develops immunity and, you know, it's just like us, except somewhere along the line the immune system develops in a, in a fetus. And it happens to, to develop about four months. So between one and three months, there is actually no functional immune system. So when this virus attacks the system and it's not spat out because there's no immune system, the virus hangs around. And when the immune system develops in a calf that's not aborted, it thinks the virus is normal. Not only that, it will never ever form antibody against that virus for the rest of its life. So it's born, even though the mother might be immune, you've got this calf inside that survived it's producing virus, it's going to produce it for the rest of its life, it's a time bomb, and these are the carriers. That's where they come from. So when they're born, they shed a lot of virus. 
and just about all of the time, and they're the, the principal source of infection for um, in, in cattle. Then the other, and, and I said earlier on that semen and aborted fetuses can do, can do the same thing. Sometimes um, PIs, as we call them, are abnormal, but many appear quite normal. They are bits of immunological cripples. I mean, this virus does always hang around with a predilection for the immune system and that sort of stuff. So if things are tough in any, any particular situation, they tend to be readily, um, they'll succumb much more readily than other animals. Um, the worst part is that we, we believe that about 100,000 PIs are born each year in Australia. Right, eh? So there's a PI. Some work I was doing with 300 calves looking at transmission rates in heifers on a station in North Queensland. Picked up this heifer, looked completely normal, but it was, it, it was walking around just shedding virus like you wouldn't believe. Um, yeah. So remember I said earlier that somewhere along the line they develop a mutation and then um, perish. What we, what we find is that typically about 50% of PIs die per year. So say you get a, um, a group of cows that are in, uh, being mated and you've got a, uh, a cow that's been bought and lands in the mob, someone's put a cow in the mob that's got one of these PIs on board, the calf's born, it's in the middle of mating, and um, um, the cows are all naive, they've never seen it before, so suddenly you've got a whole pile of abortions. Um, if cows are between one and four months of age, you get a whole pile of PIs born. So not only do you lose calves because of abortions, you've got all these PIs born. Within a year, half of them are dead. Right? Um, within two years, about 80% or some cases a lot more are dead. But interestingly enough, some can survive out to 10 years of age. Um, you know, the probabilities are that's the case. Right, eh? So some can survive to a ripe old age. In the USA, one in 300 two-year-old sale bulls are two, uh, PI. So they look completely normal. Beautiful bull, except he's a time bomb. Take him home, put him in a naive herd. You have a problem. We could have a similar figure in Australia. We don't know for sure. Right, eh? So, transmission. Generally, um, it does, it does vary, but you've got, you've got a, a calf or, a, or a, usually a young animal in a, in a group, sometimes they're herded in, in groups of several hundred. They can infect under grazing conditions about 15 um, to 30% of their, of their cohort monthly. Typically they just infect a few head each day because they hang around in families and they don't talk to every other animal every day. So transmission is not uh, terrifically high. If you box them all up in a yard for 24 hours with a small group particularly, you can get terrific um, transmission very, very quickly. But, for instance, if you have one PI in a group of 2,000 heifers in a paddock, you know, you won't get 15 to 30% transmission per month because they just don't cover the paddock, they don't come in contact, but they'll still give, you know, several animals a, a dose of uh, pestivirus each day and, you know, the overall transmission rate can be quite low. Righto, pestivirus damage. Pestivirus um, do in a herd? Well, quite simply, most of the time it's abortions and young cattle deaths. If, you, if, um, if I've been able to explain to you in the earlier slides about what happens. The interesting thing is that pestivirus is endemic in most North Australian herds. Therefore, if you've got a herd where pestivirus is hanging around, the only way it can stay there is by uh, chronic loss um, all the time. So you've got this uh, abortion here and there, or gun calf tests occurring occasionally all the time. Um, one of the causes of snake bite, I'd assume. So <coughs> if you have a if you have a um, a naive herd, never seen pestivirus before, um, it's a real you know it's a, it's a, it's a, a disaster waiting to happen. If you went to town and, and bought a PI for a bull, and, and there's lots of cases where this has happened, or you bought a mob of someone's uh, cull wieners, and they're obviously they're bad types and they're full of bloody PIs, the impact can be uh, quite devastating. 
and it's financially the recovery can be in excess of 10 years. So you can, you can just take one PI at the wrong time, can do disastrous things to your branding rate, um, and uh, not only you might have branded, it, but then you've got all, a, a lot of what you've got left might be PIs and are carefully destined to die for you. Um, it can be much less obvious in larger herds with more breed. So, for instance, if, um, if I've got a herd with 5,000 cows and I've got one paddock with 500 in it, and so I've got no pet, no pestivirus, and I introduce that to the mob, to, uh, to one of my breeder mobs, I might not get a disaster in that mob, but the way cat people move cattle around and all sorts of things happen, the overall impact on your breeding rate from year to year as it spreads and all the rest of it might not be so obvious. But, you know, if you think about it in smaller compartments in the herd, it can be quite a disaster. It's telling me that I'll be placed in. So thanks very much. I agree on the news here, Thank you. So, if we've got a, um, uh, an acute infection in a naive 3,000 adult equivalent herd, some of the, the work we've done shows that um, um, you start in here in 2007 and you've got a situation where in a naive herd where it remains pestivirus free and no vaccination and the herd growth margin just floats along like that, that's, that's fine. So <coughs> the, the heavy dotted line is if, say at this point here, you went in and vaccinated the herd uh, and then um, you, you incur the cost in the following year, there's no hit of pestivirus and then uh, from this point here you're continuing to vaccinate. Um, you can see the vaccination costs, costs a bit of money, but um, at least, you know, and, you, and you're behind the situation where you've got an IE herd without vaccination. But if you've got an IE herd and you don't vaccinate, and then pestivirus hits, you get this massive hit here, and, and the hit occurs over a number of years, and you're vaccinating and trying to control it, and the, um, the impacts occur over a number of years and it can take quite a few years to recover. Uh, we've done this and uh, Phil Holmes has done this and the same sorts of um, answers are coming out that um, it's a, it's a long-term effect in recovery from uh, a hit in a naive herd from pestivirus. So if you've got an endemic herd, you, you tend to have um, a low level or and, and persistent loss um, well, you can have it sporadic and, and uh, more noticeable. Um, if you've got the, one of the issues with reproductive diseases is that the better the infrastructure, the better control, the more problems. And the same happens with vibrio. You know, these, a lot of the time, if you've um, if you've got no management, for instance, no fences and all the rest of it, um, the young cattle carefully come in contact with all these diseases before it's a problem to them. And, uh, and by the time they get to breeding, they're all naive. But if you've got this fantastic system where you've got fences and good mustering and all the rest of it, and you segregate your cattle, um, their first exposure could come at the worst time. And, and what happens is that some people are creating, through good, you know, so-called good management, are creating naive heifer groups um, exposed during their first mating, and that's obviously a real disaster. Um, this is an example of a, a herd we were working with in northwest Queensland. Um, the virus is endemic. Um, in some years, the virus was being transmitted, so you can see in the number um, uh, in the number one in the number north cows, um, there was quite a quite a deal of uh, serial conversion in the number one, the number two, and the number three cows. There was hardly any, and what this bloke does is he keeps um, keeps these uh, Females segregated from his cow herd until they're uh, three and a half years of age, and he always notices that their fertility um, is quite low when he puts them out with the herd. Um, not always, but quite often, and you know, just put it down to the first calf cow situation. But it's a pretty high fertility herd, and this could be playing a substantial role um, in the number fours. Um, you know, the, the the virus has come back and caused quite a bit of damage, and in the number sixes. Um, you know, he, he did have 
um, some carriers in the herd when they were young and they died out before they were heifers and, and it set up a fairly naive situation with only 15% of them zero positive. So um, it, it can be, you know, this, what I'm, the, the message with this is that the biggest problems occur with the best managed herds. And, you know, that often relates sometimes to uh, smaller situations. So, um, some estimates, we, we reckon that weaning can be reduced about, by about 5% um, in endemically, per, endemically infected herds with about $6 per percentage impact of pesticides on weaning rates. So if it's causing a, say, a 3% effect on uh, weaning rates, well, that's about uh, 20 bucks. Um, uh, per adult equivalent in impact. Um, if, if, if we do the sums on um, vaccination, if we use a program where, um, which is what we recommend, say, is the vaccine, is the virus endemic or non endemic in the herd? Um, if it is, um, we, vac we look at the heifers. If the heifers are uh, are not zero converting because they're a naive group coming through, well then you vaccinate if they do happen to have carriers and most of them zero convertible, you don't vaccinate. So it's strategic vaccination. Um, we believe that it's cost effective to do that process when only 1% of chronic loss, calf loss is occurring. And overall, we estimate that the cost of pesky virus to beef industry is about 30 million. All right, guys. Um Take the first question from Kay. Sure thing I'm going to say. Right, yeah, Kay, fire away, mate. Thanks. Jeff, I'd just like you to, to run through uh, that process that you're talking about in determining whether or not you should vaccinate heifers or, or different components of the herd, just, just so I can understand it a bit better. Right. We will come on to it again, but, but it's good to repeat it a number of times. If, if the first thing is to say in a herd, is the virus floating around or not? And the way to, to know that is you test some older females that have been on the property all their life. Like if you test imported cattle, you don't know whether they got it there or somewhere else. So if you test cattle that have been there all their life, some older cattle, if antibodies show up, that means, hang on, there's been pesky virus around in this herd. So you can say, well, there's pesky virus here, Sometimes the things we're tested to do it may say, well, it's been here, it's been, been a bit pretty active recently or a fair while ago, but we'll come to that later. So mm -hmm. the, the virus is endemic. Um, then you have to make decisions about how you're going to deal with it. Uh, probably the key target group to, to consider in the first instance is your maiden heifers coming into their first mating, particularly in well-controlled herds. And so well out from mating, like six, at least six months out from mating, you would go into those heifers and take a blood sample from, say, 20 of them and test them for the virus, sorry, for the antibody against the virus. And if there's lots of antibody and lots of transmission occurring, well, you won't have to vaccinate them because you've got a PI in that group and, they, and a lot of them have been exposed naturally and they're all immune, so it's no problem. Um, but if there isn't, much transmission, say 5% of them or 20% of them only have got protection against the virus. They're going into a, a mating situation where particularly in the near future they're going to hit um, the herd where it's hanging around endemically, which means during mating they're going to see these little calves that are PIs and, and they don't have much protection, well that's when you should vaccinate. Hopefully that explains it, right? Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Joe. Yeah, hi, Kiri here. Sorry, that was my question too. All right, sorry, Kiri. Oh, sorry, hello. Uh, and uh, Nick. Yeah, um, Jeff, I was wondering um, if some of the stuff you read <coughs> about um, vaccinating heifers, but it, it's not real clear about whether that is done, as you described, like test your maiden heifers, right? They've got a heap of it. Right, we won't vaccinate, or there's not much left to vaccinate. 
Um, what happens, um, like you have those naive heifers and you vaccinate them, um, should we keep vaccinating or, or not? What's the best strategy? That, that's in a lot of literature that isn't real well explained, I find. Yeah, well, I'll come on to that later, Nick, but okay. it, depends, it depends a little bit on the, on the herd situation. Like if you, as an example of one, one extreme, you've got a, say you're a stud, a bull breeding herd. Um, if you've got, and you know, there's plenty of bull breeding herds where this virus is endemic, it's a, yeah. probably a pretty smart idea that they vaccinate all their cattle every year because the last thing they want to do is sell a PI. Um, yeah. It sort of, it depends on the level of control of your cattle to a fair degree as well. Um, if but I'm not, thinking if someone has got them pretty well under control and you've got a naive pepper group and you vaccinate, well, well that protects them for the yeah. say year one. But if you don't continue the vaccination, yeah. they revert to being virtually naive, don't they? That, that's correct, um, Nick. The, the vaccine's thought to have an effect for a, more than just the one year, that's for sure. Yeah, but, but it's not going to have an effect after two years, though, is it? I think the, think the rule of thumb, or the way to think about it, is that the more control you have, or the more segregation, that sort of stuff, the more likely you are to cop problems from it, and, you know, at the wrong time. Yeah, well, getting well, that's the wrong time. So the better the control, 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 good control over your, your young cattle, but things are a little bit out of control once they start, you know, once they start mating. So, for instance, yeah. um, you, you, you put your heifers into mating a two-year-old and then she's just continuous from there on. Yeah. So, in that situation, you probably say, well, it's just not worth it. Um, the, the, they'll, probably, they'll probably get PC virus, but it won't be at a critical time, so it won't really matter. Um, I, you know, won't, well, it's not that it won't matter, it's just that it won't be cost-effective to vaccinate. But yeah, if you've got a situation yeah. where you've got I, I, I you have your heifers set up nicely and you protect yeah, good them control and you look after them and, and then you whack them out in the main mob, you cock a hit. There is a pretty strong chance that, 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 that they could get infected at a time that's going to cause the smash the same as it right. caused the smash the year before, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And uh, unfortunately there are smashes and we're hearing hearing about smashes as people are actually looking more intensively at the herds everywhere from northwest Queensland to southwest Western Australia. Yeah. Uh, so, um, graph of the economic analysis, was, was that based on ongoing vaccinations of, of those animals? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so like that's effectively implementing a whole herd program sort of thing. I'm trying to be tricky here and find the graph. Here it is. Yeah, so it's, it's saying here that um, um, yeah, it's on, ongoing, like in the, in, the, in the worst case scenario there in that graph, you started vaccination in 2008 and then you're vaccinating continually after that. Yeah, like, so every animal, is, every retained breeder in the herd gets a set of vaccination? Um, in this particular scenario, I think it was just vaccinating the heifers each year, but Initially, it was vaccinating everything. Yeah. Because in, because what happens is in this particular sort of a case, Nick, is that you cop a hit and a naive herd goes right through your herd. Basically, you've got lifetime protection for most of the animals. Therefore, yeah. the vaccine is not worth it. So, you, you really need every situation is fairly different, and you really need some specific advice um, uh, for specific. Situation. Yeah, well, that, well, I say that's why the assessing the risk across the herd, which you're going to come to, obviously, is, is the critical thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, we might uh, we might push on. Thanks, Nick. Maybe. Uh, 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 yes, in a naive herd uh, where some heifers are already mated and four months down pregnant. Um, what's the risk of starting to vaccinate that class of cattle at that stage? Shouldn't be any risk, Alan. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Roman Roberts from the
tuning them up are you, Tim or Melissa? Uh, yes, Carter, actually, uh, from Bob Siri. Uh, just a question on the same, similar to the other ones there. Just with that 1% chronic loss, um, are you, is that interpreted that um, because of such a minimal amount, um, that you should be back, that you're better off vaccinating in 99% of situations? Is that what you're saying there, or can you just explain what you're meaning there? Yeah, when we're talking vaccination, it's more of strategic vaccination. So, I mean, if, if, I, I think it's pretty important that you get some, uh, in, a, in a particular case, that you get specific advice for your herd based on some serology that you've done. It's not like botulism where, or something like that where the vaccine's fairly inexpensive and the easiest way to do it is to vaccinate everything every year. Because the vaccine is so expensive and, and you need two shots to start off and all that sort of business, you need to, um, it's probably far more cost effective to be doing some serology, which is looking at the antibody um, profiles in your, in your herd to get an idea of what's happening before you actually, actually vaccinate. What it's saying is that if you've got, um, if you, from a, in a chronic loss, say you, say you only, say you, the advice you're given is vaccinate your heifers. Um, if it's in your herd, um, you should be, it's like what it's saying is you should be looking at vaccinating your heifers every year if it's endemic, full stop. Um, so first of all, you have to work out whether it's endemic. Um, and second, in the, in the group of heifers that are coming through, your maidens, is it being uh, transmitted well or not well in that group? And if it's not well, that's when you should vaccinate. All right, and last question taken um, from the Creek North. Yeah, just quickly, uh, just, uh, you're probably going to have a cost vaccine, a cost to, to blood, say, 20 efforts, both those costs. Um, the, the serology, I think, um, Joe's a bear, Fifteen dollars or something like that for an antibody test. Um, the vaccine is about the same. Um, but if you say you've got, you know, a thousand heifers to vaccinate, um, it's a lot cheaper to be doing your serology first than the lining up to, for the vaccine. And the vaccine is not; it doesn't cost fifteen bucks. It costs half that for the two shots. But you know, there's all the costs associated with getting cattle in because. The thing about the vaccine is you need two shots, and most people aren't handling these heifers twice at that time of the year. So it, it requires at least one extra handling, so there's, there are handling costs associated with the vaccination. Yeah, we should be mindful of. Right, right. And the gap between the two shots, um, the typical four, four weeks of, um, at least out to, you know, four to six months, it can be joke. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, guys, we might, we've got a few more slides just to finish up on, uh, well, a few more slides to go and we'll finish up with um, some questions. Right, eh? So, I've mentioned tests. There, there are a whole range of tests, but the, the key areas are antibody. Um, um, so, if we're, if we're doing an antibody test, that means if it's in, in a PI, a PI can't have an antibody because, remember I said earlier, the reason it is a PI is because it got the virus before it developed an immune system and it thinks the virus is normal. Therefore, it will never form an immune response. So, if it's not a PI and you know whether the disease, whether it's had the disease in the past, um, that's what antibody's for. And uh, the most common test we use is what we call the AGIS test or the agar immunodiffusion test. The really good thing about this test is it not only says, well, you've had the virus, but you've had it a couple of months ago or you've had it last year. So it uh, indicates how recent the infection is to a degree, and that's very helpful in trying to make decisions about which way you go with this. There are other tests available for antibody, but they're generally not as widely used as the AGIS test. The other sort of test is the virus. So the test is, is the virus in the animal or not? Right. So, um, if you if you show that it's there, and um, uh, that means well, it's a PI, or it's in this process of 
getting the virus, being there for 10 days, getting antibody and, and disappearing, which is called a transient infection. So there are virus tests. If, if um, say I was um, uh, buying bulls or selling bulls and I wanted to know in that group of bulls whether it had, whether it was a PI or not, and I did a virus test and, and an animal came back as positive, that's not saying for sure that it's a PI because it could be transient. So quite often when you get a test for the virus and it comes up positive, you need to repeat it again to make sure that it is, uh, it is a positive. You know, not all PIs are bad, um, even though they die and all the bloody rest of it. They're actually very useful for vaccinating the cattle they run with as long as you don't run them with cows that have been made of it. As an example, you know, that heifer I showed you earlier, um, the bloke who owns that one, he runs it with his um, maiden heifers to uh, vaccinate them. Um, the most common things that we use for virus tests is blood or a bit of ear notch, or you would have heard about the ear notch test. And what they do is what's called a pesivirus antigen, antigen capture eliza, or a PACE test. If you hear the word PACE, that's to do with testing the virus. We can do a DNA test, which is the PCR, polymerized chain reaction for the virus. So they're two virus tests. Right, uh, so do I have a problem? Well, we've talked about this already. Here's the virus in the herd. Um, test the older cows. So if the test comes up and says um, you're naive, well, um, that means you need a lot of vigilance. Um, you know, if you've got a herd where there's no antibody, the interesting thing about this is the vaccine doesn't actually cause the antibodies. So you can do a test even if they've been vaccinated and uh, it shows no antibodies. Um, that's uh, indicating that you're at high, high risk and if you're trading cattle and buying lots of bulls and all that sort of stuff, you're at risk. So biosecurity is a major concern. We've already talked about selection and maiden mating. Um, get some blood from up to 30 to indicate whether one or more PIs is vaccinating and hopefully that example I gave you just now about the heifer that that bloke uses to help vaccinate, helps his situation and reduces his vaccination cost. Um, and uh, if there's no PIs and endemic herd, then vaccinate. Um, Studs, um, probably pretty, very critical for them that they uh, making sure that animals they sell are not PIs. And as I said before, it's thought that we that it's probably one in three hundred of the um, animals that go through a leaf animal sales are PIs, and case test for that. This is a virus test. Um, just, uh, just to go back there, one, one point is that uh, you'll see in southern Australia where, the, where they do a lot of ear notch testing across a lot of their groups. So I think cattle are worth a lot more down there, it's a lot easier to make money out of them, and it's probably cost effective for them to actually go and find PIs and get rid of them and deal with them. Whereas in our situation, it's just it's so expensive to find PIs because the pace test, I don't know how much it costs, but it's quite, quite a bit more than the blood the antibody test. Um, it, it is just not cost effective to find them. So there are a number of things that, that we can do in controlling it. And the first, probably the most important in any situation is understand the status of your herd because everyone is different. Individual situations are really important. And um, um, just because Joe Blob's down the road vaccinating doesn't mean to say you should be. Or just because he's... Um, got some biosecurity measure doesn't mean to say you should be. And, the, and it's very it's very simple to understand the status of your herd. It's just doing that antibody profile. Um, sounds simple when you know how to bleed and can, you know manage blood, but I think that's the biggest challenge with a lot of people is just getting the blood. Um, biosecurity, checking your imported cattle. New bulls are not PIs. Prays and semen's not clear of pesky virus. I'm not quite sure what the protocols are there, but if you're buying semen, make sure there is a protocol that's there of pesky virus because the bull's a carrier and it you know, could be carefully stored in the straw. Um, there's lots of, lots of stories about people taking cattle to the show and there's another show animal there that's a PI and they bring it home and particularly in semen and um, spread it around. Um, consider your biosecurity and vaccination. 
very important that one shot gives no protection. You need two shots. Right? And the vaccine is expensive and handling may double your cost. Um, and it's also pretty important that the vaccine does not cover everything. So it's not 100% um, like most vaccines. And you know, there's, you know, I was just reading a paper yesterday where um, uh, the cattle were vaccinated, exposed to PI during mating, and you know, a couple of cows were still able to produce persistently infected calves. So it's, the vaccine is not 100% effective. It's an extremely difficult virus to actually exclude uh, from your herd and manage. Um, Further stories about control, uh, avoid carving cows and heifer groups if protection is unknown. So if you've got a, you don't know what your situation is, for instance, you haven't done a, a herd profile um, and you're carving your heifers down for the first time, probably, uh, or you're mating your heifers for the first time, don't mix them with cows um, because if you're going to create a disaster, that's the best, best way to do it in naive heifer groups. Um, there may be situations where vaccinating the whole herd is considered a mixed race, that one already, particularly where you've got very well controlled herds um, and, and they're, uh, whether they're endemic or not. Um, in some situations, identifying POs may be recommended, particularly in smaller situations where there's um, high value cattle being produced. Um, and if you do that, it's the, the blood uh, or the paste test from blood or ear notch. Yeah, one other thing that can be used is cooling of, of um, samples. So say for example I've got 20 animals I've sampled and I want to pay $15 for 20 samples, that's um, uh, 300 bucks. But if I get a little bit of juice out of each sample and put it all together and do one test and if it's negative well it means they're all bloody negative. Um, it doesn't quite work like that, but you know what I mean. You can use it because like, if you dilute it too much, you miss the, miss the antibody. But um, you can use cooling techniques to um, substantially reduce your cost. And you need to take advice from your lab or get your lab to do that to try and reduce cost sometimes. Um, yeah, if you're trying to eliminate um, um, pesky virus from the herd, um, it's pretty one one way that, that one strategy that's pretty important is going into the into the calf group before mating and actually finding the PIs and getting rid of them because that's how they that's how the virus sneaks through mate, a lot of the time from one generation to the next. Um, and a good trick if you've got some PIs is run with unmated heifers in southern Australia or places where they're putting steers in the feedlot. Um, and they're not vaccinating. If they've got a PI they can put them with the steers too if they're going into a feedlot. Um, yeah, if you, if you need to test the virus uh, to, to see if you're not, to make sure you're not selling PIs or not, don't do it the week before because if you come up with a positive test, you're still wondering a bit whether it's a transient infection or um, or a, a, a true true blue PI. So give yourself a bit of time. Um, and uh, if you've got PIs in bull, um, you know they're, they're dangerous animals because they can spread it in. The, um, Finally, some, uh, some, some things about advice. Probably the most important is that pesky virus is just one thing. I mean, because it's so topical, everyone says, ah, pesky virus, but bloody most of the time it's uh, failure to feed, as we know. Um, there could be other, other things going on there as well. But, you know, all the time, it's, if, if it's in a herd, as I said earlier, if it's if you've got tests that show that there's antibodies in older cattle in your herd that have been there all their life, the only way it's there is that you're getting some form of abortions and calf loss all the time. So um, it may or may not be technically. You need, for specific situations, probably the best advice is talk to your local cattle vet. And um, cattle vets have been hammered with all sorts of information and becoming increasingly uh, familiar with the control that's necessary for this um, this disease. Uh, Pfizer supports a very good independent advisory group and they've got a website here. This is on this, uh, this stuff's all in these notes that I said that I would send to you. 
I mean, it's said some really good stuff on that side of the thing. As an example, it could go, go through the stepwise process for how to deal with um, the situation. Thank you. Ronnie Jeff, thanks for that, mate. Uh, any questions, uh, whack your hands up. I'll start unmuting you all again. Uh, Joe, do you want to kick off, mate? Or Kiri? Um, yeah, just Kiri again. Just wondering if a if a cow is a PI, does she always have a PI calf or that doesn't necessarily happen? That's, that's true, Kiri. Okay, thanks. Because the calf, if the calf survives, um, it'll it'll be exposed to the virus in that you know that less than 100 day period. It'll pick it up and then it'll be a carrier. Through, through her blood or whatever. It just yeah, it just transmits just like in a normal infection, whether the cow's a PI or she gets it as a transient infection, the, the virus will. <coughs> Thank you. Another question. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And following that one, uh, for PI bulls, all calves by a PI bull will be will be PI. Is that correct or incorrect? All calves. Uh, you're probably not going to get a lot of calves, uh, or you you will. But one thing they do is cause a lot of abortions, Kate, right? um, and it. Um, it It's probably um, more, I'm just trying to think of the, you know, just think this through to explain a bit. The, the, if, the, if the bull delivers semen, um, gets a pregnancy and there's, and there's virus hanging around and the calf survives, there's immune re reactions and all that sort of stuff going on and, um, and it'll eliminate. But because the bull's in the herd all the bloody time, it keeps coming in contact with the animal. So they get a number of actual contacts with the animal and can... Can, um, can sneak through the system. But no, not all calves by a bull will be PIs. Um, examples that I've seen are, or I remember Peter, Peter Kirkland told me about a case in Western Australia where someone bought a PI bull and put, them, put it with, with his herd and um, half the calves, or he, he halved his pregnancy rate, or weaning rate, sorry, and of the of the remaining calves, I think about half of them were PI, so he's left with about a quarter of his calf crop that were okay. Okay, uh, any other questions for us to finish up on? Ruth? Yeah, just a question with the bulls. Um, will the vaccine uh, protect, like if you get a PI bull, um, will the vaccine protect them against that? Or because obviously the vaccine's not 100% effective, is there still a chance that, um, yeah, that the herd could become affected? Right, if a, if a bull, if a bull is not a PI, right, and it, and it, and it, uh, well, sorry, let's start, if a bull's a PI and you give it a vaccine, well, you might as well squirt it on the ground because it's going to have no impact. Can't, can't, can't do any good. But if a bull is not a PI and you give him a vaccine, what that's going to do is prevent, in m almost all cases, him getting a transient infection, which means, you know, if there's calves hanging around um, and, he, and, he, and he gets um, an, an infection, generally it's a, it's a non-event for him. Um, but, and for other animals like steers and whatever, it's, you know, it's the same, it's almost a non-event. The difference with the bull is that they can actually, um, during the transient infection, spread it on in semen, whereas most transient infection situations can't spread it on to other animals. So he adds to the um, um, the transmission situation proof and so what the vaccine does is is um, protect most of them from potentiating the transmission that uh, PI do. And through, uh, Ben? We might finish on you Nick. Okay, yeah. I just, just following up from proof Say someone was um, implementing a program to do some testing like in their maidens and across their older cows, would they be wise to just run all the bulls in and test all them if they didn't have any history on the bulls from the studs? Like now studs are starting to say like right, they're PI free, but most people would have bulls that they wouldn't have a clue really. 
Um, would it be sensible to test all your bulls so you know where you're starting from? Um, <coughs> not, not all the time. Um, you've got to remember that if you've got particularly older bulls, the probability of them being um, carriers is very, very low. Um, yeah. In a two-year-old, you've got a reasonable, you know, like you've got a, if it's if it's a PI at birth from an endemic herd, it's got a, you know, got a low chance of, um, it's got some chance of being alive at two year old, but then, you know, you, it's exponentially, they just sort of disappear out of your, out of your herd. Okay. Um, I wouldn't do it first up next, that'd be for sure. I'd be, I'd be more focused on, um, uh, on other issues first. You know, if, you, if you're worried about the source of, of the source of the of the disease, well, yeah, you could go and check some bulls. Yeah. Um, so the really younger bulls. So the indication is, like you if, if, if you do some tests and you and you've got a fairly naive herd, you you think it's fairly safe to assume that you haven't got one bull in your forty bulls that that yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, with um if if you got a you know, when when you're starting from scratch where you don't really know then whether just getting finding out exactly what all the tools are like, whether that was a useful thing to do or not, yeah. So with the bulls would you just would it be okay to do an antibody test or would you really have to do uh, the pace or the PCR to pick up if one of those bulls is is a um PI. You have to do a, a virus test to find out yeah. the PI next. Yeah, which is mean, mean it's, it's a bit more than just say the fifteen dollar antibody yeah. test, yeah.